Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webcast, The Racial Pay Gap and What Organizations Should Do Now. So this is presented, sponsored by Trusaic, and also the presenters today will be Joanna Kim Brunetti and Dr. Mark Dwyer. So this webcast has been pre-approved for one HRCI business credit and one SHRM credit. So please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credits. If you have questions or comments during the webcast, and I'm sure that you will. Our presenters will see the questions if you can just put those in the Q&A in your webinar controls. Also, I will share a link to um, the slides and a link to the exit survey. So once the presentation has ended, that will prompt um, a browser to open with the survey. So please take a moment and fill that out once the webcast is complete. So I'm going to introduce you to our presenters here. So first of all, we have um, Joanna Kimbernetti. Uh, Joanna is a former partner with Akin Gumpstrauss Hauer and Feld LLP. She has over 20 years of experience advising clients on a wide range of employment, tax, intellectual property, and other related business issues. She brings additional regulatory compliance experience from her pre-legal career in consulting and the aerospace industry. Wow. Joanna holds a BSc uh, degree in chemical engineering from University of California, Berkeley, and JD from Loyola Law School with honors. She was president of the Korean American Bar Association, Rising Star, Super Lawyers, co-chair of various subcommittees under the American Bar Association and the Los Angeles County Bar Association. Fantastic. And next we have Dr. Mark Dwyer. Mark was a formerly a senior economic consultant for the Harris Economics Group, where he provided written and oral expert testimony regarding the interpretation of empirical analysis. He directed the data cleaning and the construction of empirical models, among other responsibilities. Mark has also worked as a senior econo economist for Econ One Research, Inc., and taught econ econometrics as an assistant professor at UCLA. Mark has a PhD in economics from the University of Rochester, an MA from in finance from the Wharton School and BA in physics from University of Pennsylvania. He has been affiliated with the American Economic Association, the Economic Society, and the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. So we are in for a real treat folks today and it is now my pleasure to turn it over. I think first up is Joanna. Thank you, Rhonda. Okay, so for today's webinar, um, these are the topics we're going to be discussing. Uh, we're going to be talking about the spotlight on racial pay, uh, the racial pay gap, the existing laws that prohibit uh, racial pay discrimination, the trends that we're seeing towards closing the racial pay gap, uh, the, uh, the impact of the coronavirus on racial pay equity, and uh, then getting to the nuts and bolts of pay equity audits. Um, what the elements are, how to get started, how to stay in compliance on the annual compensation process, and then we'll leave a little bit of time for some questions and answers. And to be clear, to the extent that we don't answer all the questions, we will um, provide them in writing later, okay? All right, next slide. Okay, so well, what is the racial pay gap? Um, sometimes it's called the racial wage gap, but basically um, it is typically the measure of pay differences between white and other racial ethnic uh, uh, groups across an employer, a different organization, or just society in general. So that's what we're talking about really. Typically it's comparing uh, between white uh, employees and non-white employees, and then the, the non-white employees are in subcategories. Um, and they're uh, you know, delineated, for example, here. This is a 2019 online survey that explores the wage gap uh, between men uh, of different races. And you'll see that in this chart, for $1 earned by a white male, uh, you have uh, African Americans at 87 cents, um, and indigenous folks at 91 cents, uh, Latino folks at uh, 91. Pacific Islander at 95 cents to the dollar and Asians at $1.15 to the dollar, or Asian Americans. So what you're seeing is that's often how the analysis is described, basically, you know, X cents on the dollar, uh, which is the group that's being compared to typically um, the white uh, male. 
Okay, next slide. One of the things that was is particularly severe and persistent and very concerning is the gap between African Americans and white Americans. Um, the Economic Policy Institute had conducted uh, a study and found that not only is there a consistent, persistent gap between uh, the, basically the black and white wage gap, but it's only gotten worse. So you can see on the chart here, um, you know, let's let's focus on uh, the high school, college, and um, uh, advanced degree slides. You'll uh, category. You'll see that you know the dark blue line that was the wage gap in 2000. The grayish blue line is 2007, and the light blue line is 2019. So they're very ballpark, about 10 years apart. And you see that the gap is only getting worse, and it's in every category. Okay, next category. Next slide, please. So what what's happening is there's you know there's been massive and widespread uh, protesting um, very recently triggered by the George Floyd killing, and then you overlay that with COVID. Um, but racial equality um, issues have really come to the fore. Uh, the sh there's been a shift in polls showing large bipar bipartisan majority of Americans supporting the protests. Here are just some of the headlines that, that we're seeing, you know, uh, very recently, um, recognizing that employers need to, you know, close the racial wage gap. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, exposure and publicity about our big corporations really actually trying to reduce the pay gap and just saying Black Lives Matter is not enough. Um, and also uh, the New York City controller seeking public disclosure of existing uh, compensation data reporting in the EEO one, which I'll talk to uh, more about in a little bit, um, and you know, uh, companies uh, basically having employees, sh you know, be more affirmative in sharing their salaries, um, in concern about pay discrimination. Okay, next slide. Okay, so all of this is going on right now, and what's what's been the lay of the land? Well. Here are uh, both federal and state laws, uh, an overview that deals specifically with pay discrimination. We have Title VII, which is uh, an overarching um, federal law that protects uh, employees and job applicants from employment discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. And it protects the full spectrum of employment decisions, including recruitment, selection, termination, and other decisions dealing with employment. Among those uh, decisions is pay. So pay discrimination is protected uh, uh, by the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. And um, since then, that Civil Rights Act of 1991, uh, which amends the basic Title VII, is it increases compensatory punitive damages for intentional discrimination in hiring and firing, uh, and also intentional uh, increases damages for intentional uh, racial discrimination in employment. Um, another federal law that's uh, relevant is the Civil Service Reform Act of 1978, but it's limited to federal employees. So that's the basic overview with regard to federal law in uh, racial discrimination. And what, what's happened is that states have recognized that um, federal law is not doing enough. And so, for example, in California, um, what it did was create its own uh, Equal Pay Act um, to, uh, to more broadly protect um, against uh, pay discrimination and other forms of discrimination. So um, under the federal Equal Pay Act, which is really limited to gender, um, California's Equal Pay Act extends it to race and ethnicity. And instead of the basic framework under the federal Equal Pay Act of in a nutshell, equal pay for equal work. What California has done is is basically broaden that um, to make it 
substantially similar work in, in when viewed in a composite of skill, effort, and responsibility. And um, so what it does is it makes it easier for employees to sue uh, an employer. Um, so they, they, it's not as rigid a standard to show pay discrimination. And other states have followed. Uh, interestingly, so California did the equal their Equal Pay Act in 2016 Shortly after that, New Jersey followed in 2018, um, and then New York, Oregon, and Illinois followed uh, last year. So as you see, there is this sort of trend towards that. Okay, next slide. Okay, so speaking of trends, um, you know, the as I alluded to earlier, the New York City Controller has pushed for this public disclosure of EEO. Uh, one reporting the US is watching the UK which right now there is a petition by the people to include uh, you know race uh, pay gap reporting um, beyond existing gender uh, pay reporting and another trend is that salary histories uh, salary history bans are finding footing uh, so far there's 19 states and 21 localities that have that and salary history bans basically prevents employers from asking what the job applicant is getting paid or was getting paid in their uh, former job um, and the idea of that is to have all um, job applicants on equal footing when they are applying for a job and so to the extent that the employee had been discriminated in their prior employment that doesn't carry over to the new employer. There's also uh, laws prohibiting retaliation against employees who discuss salary. As I'd mentioned uh, in the earlier slide about uh, employers, employees basically banding together to discuss salaries um, uh, to, uh, you know, fight against pay discrimination. Um, the, the idea is that uh, laws that prohibit retaliation against employers who have, you know, basically say employees, you can't discuss salaries with each other. Um, that would also, you know, that kind of additional transparency would uh, facilitate uh, pay equity. And that's been adopted in 15 states in Washington, D.C. And there's also been industry leaders um, that have been promoting change, um, you know, including the likes of Netflix, Nike, Twitter, um, you know, very high profile um, companies that everybody recognizes. Now, um, I had kind of alluded to this EEO1 reporting and I wanted to mention, so EEO1 reporting in, in a nutshell provides, uh, there's component one and component two, um, but with component two, that pay data reporting required employers with 100 or more employees to report um, to the EA, EEOC uh, wages for their employees for different job categories um, based on race, ethnicity, and gender. And that was instituted under the Obama administration and it was supposed to take effect um, after Obama left office. However, the Trump administration basically put a halt on it and as a result of litigation by a uh, uh, nonprofit organizations uh, pushing for that pay, pay reporting. Um, the net result was that the 2017 and 2018 years were required to be reported. And again, this is for employers with 100 or more employees. So that's a large swath of the uh, employer pool. So that reporting ha was submitted to the EOC and it exists there, but it wasn't publicly reported. And so, you know, to the New York City Controller's uh, request that it actually be disclosed. Um, so this EO reporting, um, as I said, is essentially put off, you know, it's ceased um, after 2018. But with the November elections coming up, if um, Joe Biden prevails um, to assume the presidency, that could signal a return and reinstitution of that component to uh, pay data reporting. And uh, one of the things that has happened is, so SB 973, which was introduced um, earlier this year, is basically a uh, a fill-in of the EEO1 reporting that had been put on pause. So SB973 um, is essentially the same as EEO1 re uh, pay reporting, except that it's, you know, it's limited to California's uh, jurisdiction. 
it hasn't passed. It's right now in, in committee. Um, so we'll see whether that happens, but that would essentially put back EEO1 reporting um, for gender and race and ethnicity uh, in the same way that the EEO1 uh, component two data um, was, uh, was intended to do. There's also, uh, you know, California, which is often just uh, one of the, the uh, early adopters of uh, legislation, uh, worker safety legislation and the like. Um, California also had uh, attempted to pass uh, AB 1209, which was back in 2017, and that was more in this, it was in the spirit of the UK quality uh, regulations that currently require reporting uh, by employers and that sort of public shaming on websites. It didn't pass, but again, that may be, uh, you know, revived at some point. Okay, one other thing I wanted to mention with the November elections, um, Kamala Harris, who is, uh, you know, obviously the Democratic uh, vice presidential nominee, um, she has been a very a strong advocate for racial and gender equality. And last year, she had really pushed for the notion of equal pay certification um, to demonstrate that employers had eliminated pay disparities. Um, you know, for equal work, essentially. Um, and this process, this equal pay certification process would allow, uh, would basically have the employer uh, have the burden of proof to show that there isn't pay discrimination. So these are just, you know, um, basically seeds of what may potentially be happening, um, you know, in the not too distant future. Um, next slide. So I had alluded to, you know, COVID-19 um, playing a part in this racial, uh, the racial pay gap issue. Um, the CDC, they have, you know, reported that there is um, increasing evidence that uh, racial and ethnic, ethnic minorities are disproportionately affected by COVID. Um, there are other, uh, you know, reputable reporting that basically um, there are significant differences in health outcomes, um, economic outcomes impacted by coronavirus. So what this is doing is exacerbating the existing racial inequalities um, that uh, that are really have reached, you know, um, kind of a tipping point with the Black Lives Matter protesting that um, that recently occurred. Okay, next slide. Okay, so with all that said, the the urgency of trying to achieve racial pay equality, what should organizations do? And, you know, it's been essentially unanimous that doing a pay equity audit is a critical tool in addressing and remediating, uh, you know, racial pay pay disparities. That's really what it is, conducting a pay equity audit to see where you are in terms of your, where uh, racial pay gaps exist or not. Next slide. Okay, so well, what is a pay equity audit? Well, it is an analysis of your workforce that identifies pay disparities or, you know, which ultimately result in liabilities. It places statistical weights on business factors that contribute to the pay gap. Oh, what does that mean exactly? What it means is you have a pay uh, you have a pay gap, which is basically the differentials in the diff you know uh, whether it's white, uh, African American, uh, Latino, Asian American, um, Indigenous. What that these there are business factors that can actually contribute to the pay gap that is not a function of race or ethnicity, but rather legitimate factors such as, uh, for example. Um, whether someone has a, an advanced degree in that position uh, would be, uh, you know, better served with a person with an advanced degree, or the person had, had been there, you know, many years as opposed to another person. So these are really, they're what I'll just call uh, bona fide factors. They're legitimate factors as to why, you know, person A gets paid less than person B, and it's not a function of race. So uh, having the analysis to place statistical weights on these factors that contribute to the uh, pay gap reduces the ultimate exposure uh, to liability or the pay disparities. And importantly, 
a pay equity audit uh, is legally uh, can be legally privileged if it's overseen by counsel. And so that's important from a confidentiality standpoint. And what this pay equity uh, audit will, will do is it will help you identify the root causes for the pay disparities and why they exist. So knowing what the pay gaps are um, and the pay disparities are and where they exist and the quantification of that is what you need to devise, devise the right remediation strategy and see what progress you are making. And at the end of the day, it improves recruitment and retention and public relations. Okay, next slide. Okay, so in, in conducting a pay equity audit, um, ex executive sponsorship and coordination, those are key. Now, Chuseik had sponsored um, a Harvard Business Analytics pay equity survey, and it was mostly executive and senior management and compared U.S. versus U.K. And um, what I had alluded to earlier is that U.K. has this actual uh, legislative pay reporting requirement, unlike the U.S. in general. So when you looked at those two models, um, what came out of that survey, uh, an important uh, takeaway was what are the external drivers that are motivating employers to conduct a pay equity audit? Um, you know, it was the, the US and UK both found that mitigating legal risk is really important uh, of approximately equal significance. Um, there was a difference though, as I mentioned, UK actually has a mandatory pay reporting requirement. And so the UK were, were, was, you know, a significant factor was that reporting requirement. Whereas in the US, um, the ex exter uh, an, an external factor that was uh, very important was the, the winning the war on talent, improving hiring and retention. So that had more emphasis on um, on the US, whereas the UK, the reporting requirement had more emphasis. Josaic also had had its pay equity advisory panel conduct a survey, and these are senior executives in human resources and compensation uh, areas. And, um, you know, unanimously, uh, the idea of implementing a pay equity solution was would support better public relations, protect the company and the CEO reputation. They also recognize that it can be easily initiated by the human resources department, but it's really important to have the executives uh, buy in into that effort. They also noted that when you're conducting a pay equity audit, it's really important to adopt an annual cycle uh, in addressing pay equity. And the reason for that is that uh, workforces are fluid, that a pay equity audit is just a snapshot in time. And so when you do a pay equity audit, at one point, um, you know, a, a year later, the picture might be very different. Pe more people get hired, uh, some people leave, some people get promoted, et cetera. And so when you have these changes to compensation, job position, and uh, overall workforce, it's going to change that analysis. So it's, you know, the Trusaic's Pay Equity Advisory Panel Survey really recognized that fluidity and that it that there may be a need for multi-year uh, ongoing effort um, to make sure that you know what your picture is in, uh, in your pay equity uh, landscape and whether or not you're achieving it through ongoing uh, remediation efforts. Okay, next slide. Okay, so, okay, with all that said, um, should, organizations should be proactive and get started now. Um, you know, there, there's a couple of quotes I thought were really kind of pertinent to what's going on. Um, there are risks and costs to action, but there are far less than the long range risks of comfortable inaction. And that's what's, that's from John F. Kennedy. And that's a lot of what employers are feeling. They're concerned that if they do something, it'll be wrong. But to that point, uh, quote from uh, Theodore Roosevelt, in, in any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The next best thing is the wrong thing. And the worst thing you can do is nothing. So this is the key. Like uh, human resources executives are scared to do uh, a pay equity audit. They're afraid they're going to find something bad and then they're not sure what to do about it. But here's the key. Fear is not the reason to avoid looking at the pay gaps. 
the pay gaps are there whether the company's looking at it or not. And I, as I had mentioned earlier um, about the EEO-1 reporting, all employers with at least 100 employees were required to submit EEO-1 reporting. So it's there. It is confidential in the, uh, in the EEO-C uh, space. That's the Equal Opportunity uh, Commission. But it is, you know, it can be subpoenaed. Um, it can be obtained. So it's there. So the question is, are you going to wait until you, you know, re and behave reactively through uh, a lawsuit, having to deal with settlement or judgment, or are you going to do it in advance and try to uh, to uh, get ahead of it? And at the end of the day, an employer that plans in advance and conducts a pay equity audit is is far more cost effective than handling it on the back end in reaction. And that was, uh, you know, what a key takeaway from the Trusaic's Pay Equity Advisory Panel, not surprisingly. Okay. So, uh, next slide. Okay. So, where do you start and how to begin? Um, in doing a pay equity audit, the, the compensation data uh, and the makeup of the workforce, that's going to be, you know, really the key. Um, you want to leverage compensation and compliance experts. That's going to be really important. And the team will function best if it has guidance and support. And um, there are solutions out there from a do it for me versus do it yourself. And not surprisingly, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, people feel that a do it for me solution is better. And the reason for that is, you know, a lot of um, do it yourself software out there, it's very hard to uh, accurately and defensively figure out um, how the, uh, the business factors that go into reducing an apparent pay gap, that's just the raw data, um, and how that could be reduced legitimately and defensively. Um, so having an external consultant um, who can advise on what data to capture, what to review and analyze, and has the knowledge and know-how to how to conduct it um, is, is really important. Now, there are, uh, you know, vendors out there who can provide no-cost gap analysis that's just going to identify the raw gap. Um, and there's also uh, vendors out there that can provide uh, basically pay equity consultation to kind of get you started, answer your questions. Um, you know, Trusaic is a company that provides those kind of um, no cost uh, uh, services. But anyway, having a plan about what you're going to do, uh, what your plan of attack is, is going to be really important. Having that ready, taking it back to the executive team to move forward with the business case on conducting a pay equity audit is how you want to get started. Okay, so with that, let me turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Dwyer, who's going to start off on the next slide. Thank you, Joanna. Hello, everyone. Uh, for the next few slides, we'll be going into some detail regarding the critical elements of the pay equity audit. We'll also review how compensation adjustments recommended by the pay equity audit can be incorporated into the annual compensation adjustment cycle in your organization. So the starting point, uh, just to reiterate, of any pay equity audit is getting the data right. Uh, with, with respect to getting the data right, the first uh, part of that is starting uh, with, make, with assembly, making sure the assembly of the data is being protected by legal, uh, by legal privilege. So make sure your legal counsel is directing the data poll, the way the data is pulled and assembled. Uh, that's part of the pay equity audit. And, uh, and, that the, and that your legal counsel is present on all calls and emails related to assembling the data for the audit. The goal here, again, is to ensure that the process is covered by attorney-client privilege and or the attorney work product doctrine. Okay, so next, having that out of the way, ensuring that the data, the appropriate data has been gathered, the appropriate data has been gathered, combined, validated, and properly interpreted is often the most time-consuming portion of the pay equity audit. If you take a do-it-yourself approach, 
you're also taking on this rather large uh, data set. Unfortunately, it's also the case that most do-it-for-me solutions leave these data challenges often, and most of the time, to the employer organization as well. <clears throat> uh, the integrity of the pay equity audit can suffer as a consequence. If you evaluate different do-it-for-me solutions, be sure to ask, how, ask about how the data will be processed. Does the solution that you're considering require you to collect, merge, validate, and properly dis distinguish all the data and then submit it in a nice clean spreadsheet? If so, the solution that you're considering, that even a do-it-for-me solution, leaves a lot of work on, on your plate. Okay. Once the data uh, are assembled and combined, it is at this point that errors and omissions come to light and need to be addressed. Just, just wanted to provide a few examples of what what can go wrong here, what, to, <clears throat> what one needs to be sensitive to. So there can be inconsistencies across systems, just different data systems, that may cause employees <clears throat> to uh, be misidentified in terms of their race ethnicity, their overtime exempt status, full versus part-time status, hourly versus salary pay designations, or EEO1 job categories. Um, uh, a historical payroll, uh, as a second example, historical payroll may be out of sync with employee position information, such as when an employee has been promoted recently, like in the last year, to a new position, and their prior position is not in the data, <clears throat> it's been omitted, their annual compensation can seem low. <clears throat> so that's an example where there's an omission that, that needs to be tracked down. Also, the data can reflect inconsistent or unified differences in compensation periods, such as whether compensation is paid weekly or bi-weekly. This can even, it can even, even be multiple pay period uh, cycles. Okay, so in addition to pulling, cleaning, combining uh, the data, the next issue is interpreting the data correctly. Because this helps to avoid, draw, all of these steps help to uh, avoid drawing wasteful and counterproductive compensation Interpretation includes properly understanding why you have missing values in your data. Many vendors, as I've heard this in, in some uh, presentations, many do it for me uh, solutions. If you have missing uh, observations, they drop that data. They don't ask any questions about it. They just drop it, okay, which uh, I, is a big mistake. Um, so ask about that in terms of if you're considering do it for me solutions. So for example, performance reviews uh, may, may have missing values, and, and they can be missing for different reasons. Uh, uh, and those different reasons need to be identified in the pay equity audit rather than, rather than just throwing that data away. So new hires will be missing uh, performance reviews, and that's one issue. Uh, senior managers may be missing performance reviews, and that's something different from, from a new hire missing a performance review. And those need to be represented differently in the analysis. Uh, rather than just discarding all uh, performance review data. So another, a final example, is the proper treatment of tenure within the company and how, temp how temporary needs are defined. So uh, is the tenure clock, is, it, is, it, uh, uh, is there a sense of continuity with the company that, that affects compensation, or, or is tenure, when you're gone, you're gone, and that's it. Uh, that doesn't, uh, if you come back, that doesn't, your clock starts over, or uh, that break is, uh, is deleted. So those, those are important interpretation issues. Uh, these kinds of errors and not, and not thinking about the data carefully, not, not pulling it correctly and interpreting it correctly, there are two types of effects. First, what looks like unexplained pay disparities uh, uh, can actually be explained once employees' positions and attributes are correctly accounted for. Second, data errors can hide disparities between groups who have comparable pay. So they look like they're paid the same, but they actually shouldn't be paid the same. For example, if one group has substantially more of some business relevant characteristic that is not correctly identified in the data. Uh, a, a quote uh, from uh, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw is relevant here. Treating different things the same can generate as much inequality as treating the same thing differently. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. And Dr. Dwyer, I'm sure um, there's no way that you can turn the volume up. I think you're calling in via phone, correct? I, I am, yeah. Yeah, is I think any better? Go again. I'm trying to again. Is this any better? A little louder. A little louder? <clears throat> yeah, I've got, got it maxed up right now. Yeah, okay. That's, that's okay. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, 
here, here we're talking about deliverables. And here again, I, I'd like to uh, get, just get some guide, guideposts here. So beyond getting the data correct, uh, I'm briefly going to discuss six deliverables here that you should look for in a pay equity audit solution. In, in terms of an overview, the six are determining pay analysis groups, uh, which is mentioned in our first bullet point here, the lens of pay analysis groups. Determining pay analysis groups. Number two, identifying and decomposing pay gaps. Three, detecting pay disparities. Number four, investigating the root causes of pay disparities. Number five, specifying compensation remediation strategies. So what are you gonna, how are you gonna remediate the problem? And number six, ongoing monitoring. So our first bullet point here refers to this lens of pay analysis groups. What, what are those? So pay analysis groups determine how the workforce will be segmented for the audit. Are those groupings empirically defensible? Is the, is the workforce being divided up in, in a defensible fashion? <clears throat> like pulling the data and verifying data integrity, many pay equity solutions put the burden of determining these groupings on the employer who likely hasn't invested in the statistical methods that evaluate and help to specify pay analysis groups. So ask about pay, how pay analysis groups are determined. Second, once pay analysis groups are determined, the next deliverable is measuring pay gaps <clears throat> across protected classes, such as between workers of different races, and then by regression analysis to see what portion of those pay gaps are explained by the identified or legitimate business factors that Joanna uh, described earlier. Sorry, we're still on the, there we go. Uh, for example, what portion of the black-white pay gap among managers is due to differences in tenure, experience, or job responsibilities? That's what uh, we refer to this decomposition of the pay gap into business factors as the gap decomposition, the pay gap decomposition. So the findings of, about what's driving the pay gap, these, these findings have implications for diversity and accessibility efforts. Differences in these legitimate pay drivers provide insights regarding potential problems with retention, promotion, advance, or advancement opportunities, and or mentoring that disproportionately affect one race relative to another. Earlier in the results that Joanna presented, we saw that about 10 percentage points of the black-white pay gap was explained by the regression analyses that were conducted by the Economic Policy Institute. That regression controlled for average differences in education, age, and region. Breaking that down further to know what, whether education or region or age did most of the explaining is what a pay gap, that's an example of what a pay gap decomposition would provi provide, okay? Those results also highlight the importance of starting with complete data because these are what you're using to understand why people are paid differently. As an employer, you would like to have additional information such as position and tenure with the company, management revenue responsibility, all of which are likely to further explain the pay gap beyond the, the sort of high level example that we saw earlier. And as a consequence, identify additional aspects of diversity, accessibility, and inclusivity for examination. Okay, the next thing to look for <clears throat> is the pay disparity. Okay? So a main, a main deliverable from the pay equity audit is the measurement of the portion of the pay gap that remains after controlling the legitimate fact factors. That's what we're calling the pay disparity. We refer to protected classes that have pay disparities as impacted classes. Pay disparities represent more immediate liability risks for the employer because they constitute statistical evidence of a systematic pay discrimination favoring one protected class versus another. So we talked about uh, the overall gap and understanding that in terms of business factors, and, and now we talk about what we can explain by business factors. And the next deliverable is that a pay equity audit solution should give you some insight into the root causes of those parts that can't be explained, the pay disparities. This additional inquiry looks within an impacted class, uh, so within black men, for instance, black male managers say, for additional variation in the degree to which uh, these employees appear to be undercompensated. Uh, and where, where, are, where are the largest underpayments? Um, can, are, can we identify a specific location, a specific department, a specific division in which that is uh, concentrated? Identifying these sources allows you to deploy policy and procedural remediation strategies to tackle root causes that gave rise to disparities in the first place and would likely generate future disparities. So due to time limitations, today we're moving past these organizational remediation elements, like address, uh, you know, 
from this root cause analysis and focusing instead on compensation adjustment, <clears throat> remediation strategies, uh, and how they're impl impl implemented in terms of compensation adjustment. Once you know what your pay disparities are and have a strategy for addressing the root causes of future disparities, this still leaves the question as to what to do about existing pay disparities. And that brings us to another deliverable that a pay equity audit solution should pr provide, and, and that's the final two bullet points on this slide, compensation and remediation strategies. And we've broken these down into two different approaches, really. Uh, so the, uh, to, to just to step back for a second, Compensation remediation strategies are evaluated with respect to a predictive model, a pay equity predictive model for each pay analysis group. These predictive models allow you to examine how your pay equity situation would change under various hypothetical compensation adjustments. So being able to make predictions about what happens if I raise certain, change certain compensation, that's what this predictive model, um, and that's a deliverable from a pay equity audit solution. These have two, two approaches, the all class approach under the all-class uh, strategy, the budget for addressing pay disparities is distributed across the most underpaid employees relative to the predictive model, regardless of whether they belong to an impacted class. That is, the all-class approach raises compensation regardless of whether the underpaid employee is, is in a protected class with an identified pay disparity. In the case of a black-white pay disparity, the all-class approach would raise some white workers' wages as well as wages of some black, of, of some black workers. Under the second impact class strategy, the budget for addressing pay disparities is focused on underpaid employees only in the impacted classes. Again, in the example of a black-white pay disparity, the impact, impact class approach would focus resources on raising wages for the most underpaid black workers in the affected pay analysis group. So neither approach fits all organizations. Uh, it's possible to blend the two approaches uh, for hybrid strategies. The all-class approach is less efficient in reducing your, your, your pay disparities. Uh, it's not surprising. A, strong, uh, a stronger identification of root causes of the pay disparity may lower the risk of potential reverse discrimination claims with a more targeted impact class approach. And then before moving on, just one final deliverable is on, uh, that Joanna also mentioned is this notion of ongoing monitoring on how effective the changes in policies, procedures, and compensation have been in eliminating pay disparities. This ongoing tracking of your pay equity position is also accomplished through uh, evaluation of your workforce and their compensation through the pay, pay equity predictive model. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so now we get to uh, this idea of so we'll put the strategies aside just for, for the moment. Whichever one you, you choose, the next question is how to implement them. <clears throat> and uh, the, the natural place to do this is within uh, the annual compensation cycle. <clears throat> and so I just want to provide a few minutes of background on the annual compensation cycle. This, by, the, by the annual compensation cycle, what we're talking about here is making adjustments to base pay, uh, bonus, potentially determining bonuses, and also may include discretionary uh, equity awards. <clears throat> According to one study, 82% of companies in the U.S make their compensation adjustments at the same time each year, in other words, on an annual basis. While most U.S. companies rely on compensation management software, about 40% still use uh, uh, spreadsheets to manage the process. Uh, but w w whichever approach you take, um, we we've tried to break this down into three components. So we've represented the annual compensation cycle consisting of a guidance phase, a proposed adjustment phase, and a final calibration phase. So the first guidance phase, <clears throat> which uh, we have in yellow here, typically conveys minimum and maximum compensation ranges, as well as some type of trigger mechanism to alert managers, managers who are recommending adjustments that are outside those recommended ranges. These ranges may be augmented with statistics summarizing the external salary market in terms of min, average, max, compa ratios, and if and how performance ratings uh, should be tied to compensation adjustments, as well as several levels of budget consideration. So that all goes into what uh, managers may be provided for in the guidance phase. The second proposed adjustment phase uh, is where managers make compensation uh, decisions, and those are vetted uh, up, up, the level, up various levels of management and, and receive uh, you know, tentative approval before finally being uh, implemented. The third, uh, what we refer to as, and often referred to as the calibration phase, 
that's the final sign-off, okay, and the final review. And that provides HR, senior leadership, and potentially comp committees an opportunity to review merit, bonus, and equity changes and to make any final adjustments that are needed. It is usually here that HR leadership is able to find hot spots and make adjustments or inquiries and ensure overall alignment with the organization's budgetary and compensation goals. And it's only after we've gone through those three phases, after the final calibration phase, that compensation changes are put into effect. <clears throat> of these three phases of the annual compensation, compensation cycle, pay remediation can most effectively be uh, incorporated into the first guidance phase and the last uh, or third calibration phase. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. Okay, so, in court, so let's, let's talk about that first phase, the, gu the guidance phase for a couple of minutes. Here, we take a look at how the pay equity audit can interact with the guidance phase. In, in this phase, HR and finance build in conditions to keep managers within pay boundaries that reflect individual performance, market salary conditions, and budget restrictions. These pay boundaries take the form of a recommended range table for different compensation types, whether they be merit, bonus, or equity. Pay equity results can readily be incorporated, incorporated into this process and thereby advance remediation objectives. Pay equity objectives often affect both the lower and the upper portions of recommended, range, recommended pay rate ranges because the pay equity audit identifies any employees with inexplicably high compensation as well as those who are underpaid. Restraining further compensation increases for overpaid employees can further remediation efforts as well, can, can advance them. <clears throat> these compensation containment boundaries provide some degree of offset because these upper bounds on compensation increases. That's what, what, what I mean by uh, containment. <clears throat> uh, offset to the, uh, provide, provide some degree of offset to the, to the fact that you're, <clears throat> pardon me, also trying to increase wages, right, for underpaid employees. So there's a bit of, a, of an offset there. Since the overall recommended pay ranges continue to reflect multiple objectives, market conditions, uh, business conditions, and so on, by, by them being combined into a, a single range table, they do not disclose the specific results of the pay equity audit. So there's this issue about maintaining privilege, okay? And by combining these objectives into one recommended uh, pay table, uh, one, one set of recommendations, uh, the pay equity uh, specific results aren't disseminated as widely throughout the organization. Higher minimums for some employees can be due to market conditions or budgetary factors, and the same applies to lower maximums for other employees. So the next slide, we consider the um, role of pay equity adjustments in uh, the next phase, the uh, proposed adjustment phase. Okay, there we go. Uh, so uh, because, so the second phase of the annual compensation cycle is where various levels of management propose and vet <clears throat> compensation adjustments because the pay equity audit provides and should provide a pay equity predictive model, it's possible to, enter, to, to tie that model into your, your software or your uh, shared spreadsheets and to uh, give immediate feedback to managers as to whether they're uh, w uh, within range or not, okay? Um, but but we, we think that the disadvantages of such a real-time monitoring and feedback type of approach tend to outweigh any advantages. Okay, so that just potential advantage is that you're able to intervene. Uh, the real-time monitoring is that you, you intervene earlier with specific cases where proposed compensation is at odds with the guidance provided by the first phase, by the guidance phase. Some disadvantages, though, is, is that it's usually difficult to see what the net effect on the organization's tactic situation will be of a specific manager's proposed compensation change. There are just too many moving parts at any point in time. Some adjustments will still be outstanding during this phase. Uh, things are not settled. Um, it's not until all the proposed adjustments have been made that concrete conclusions can be reached regarding the overall pay equity impact for the organization. A possible exception to this uh, downside is where disparities are quite narrowly identified as being within the control of a small set of managers. Then you're, you really have a, a smaller uh, situation that you're dealing with. Another disadvantage, though, is that the proposed compensation adjustments that are at variance with guidance are usually best reviewed within the, within the context of the whole organization. This allows for systemic or systematic issues to be identified. A final disadvantage uh, is that the individualized interventions may make pay equity remediation more discoverable. Intervening with an individual manager 
may unintentionally reveal more about impacted classes because that kind of interaction seems to need more justification or explanation than just an organizational-wide adjustment, final, final adjustment to compensation. For these reasons, although the predictive model can be employed in this proposed adjustment phase, the circumstances under which this is ad advantageous are probably limited. Okay, if we move to the next slide, we'll get to the final phase of our adjustment cycle. <clears throat> okay, so this, now we're into the, the final calibration phase. So this third calibration phase is where final assessments and adjustments are made. Uh, in, this, in this phase, the compensation management software can share proposed adjustments with the, with the pay if predictive model to assess the net effect of all of the proposed changes on pay disparities. One reason why such a pay equity review during this, during this phase, the calibration phase, which just at the end of the annual compensation process is particularly valuable, is that it is less likely that additional factors such as workforce, demographic changes, or organizational changes have moved since the pay equity audit <clears throat> results. This assessment of pay equity impact then provides a clear answer to the question, has the incorporation of these compensation remediation goals into guidance improved the overall pay equity status of the organization? And if so, what, to what degree? So it gives you that quantification that Joanna mentioned. Leadership reviews these pay equity remediation progress measures, as well as the external competitiveness and budgetary constraints, these other motivations for, uh, that, that influence compensation, and can then intervene before those changes are finalized and committed to payroll and HR systems. In doing so, HR and compensation professionals can ensure that not only did they successfully execute the annual compensation cycle, but that it was conducted in a way that improved the overall pay equity status of the organization. There's an important extra feature to this uh, final, uh, to, to viewing pay equity at this final phase here, not just meeting it in the guidance phase. During this calibration phase, exceptions or resistance to guidance should also be, be reviewed to identify any systemic trends <clears throat> or issues. Trends in guidance exceptions, where, there's, where there's, a, there's pressure against some of the recommendations that seems more widespread than just indi individual managers, that can reflect prevalent views that uh, pay guidance is not fitting compensation realities. This suggests that revising the guidance might be the better option in forcing managers into compliance. This ability to discern and accommodate consensus views is much less apparent if you would try to intervene in that second phase, okay, where we're, where we're talking about in the, in the actual proposed adjustment phase. Earlier, we reviewed how getting the most out of the pay equity audit requires resolving data issues in the available legitimate pay factors first, right? We talked about this, getting the data right. But compensation can also vary due to, due to legitimate business factors that are not tracked or that are just not that readily available. Such missing factors can become apparent through trends, through these trends that we're talking about, through this feedback mechanism. So identifying and formalizing and tracking these additional compensation factors you have, that, you have an option to start to expand the set of legitimate business factors by paying attention to the feedback you're getting in this calibration phase. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. Here we go. So what are the recommendations here? <clears throat> uh, to sum up, <laughs> conducting a proactive privileged pay equity audit is the best response to a number of recent developments, including the increase in pay equity legislation at the state and local level throughout the U.S., the increase in pay equity legislation internationally, the increasing diversity of customers, employees, and shareholders, the, in the litigation context, the increasing emphasis on statistical analyses that are used in pay equity audits, and, and as Joanna mentioned, the renewed awareness of systemic discrimination, both in the ongoing disproportionate health and economic impact of COVID, of the COVID pandemic among Latinos, Blacks, women, and mothers, and following the tragic killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Armand Arbery, and too many others. Again, we have this re renewed awareness of, of systemic discrimination. To build on the quotations that Joanna offered, another thought is that inaction is just all too easily construed as, in, as indifference. So in terms of conducting a pay equity audit, most experts agree that engaging an external pay equity provider to work at the direction of your counsel with selected members of HR leadership and database administration is the best approach. This process maintains privilege and is the default approach that Trusaic takes to performing pay equity audits. 
The results of the pay equity audit provide insights into appropriate organizational remediation steps and pay remediation strategies that are tailored to budgetary limitations. Trizek's pay parity pay equity audit service evaluates both the remediation strat both of the remediation strategies we touched on earlier, both the all class and the impact class uh, um, remediation strategies for, for you. These pay remediation strategies are readily incorporated into compensation adjustment guidelines and reevaluated for effectiveness in the calibration phase of the compensation cycle. That's what we just went over. Those uh, again, focusing on the guidance and calibration phases. The annual pay equity predictive model goes further though because it provides the foundation for ongoing monthly monitoring of your organization's pay disparities and headline pay gaps as the composition of your workforce evolves. Again, uh, just uh, would like to ask you, if you haven't done so already, a, a great place to start uh, a pay equity journey is with our free pay gap risk assessment. <clears throat> and we're offering um, a survey question here just to give you uh, an opportunity to uh, indicate your interest on that. This measures the, over, the, the average uh, wage differences by gender and race ethnicity across your workforce, headline pay gaps. These headline pay gaps that are identified in this report are what a full pay equity audit seeks to address by controlling for legitimate factors. The results of the pay gap analysis can help support the case of a pay equity audit with your organization's leadership. Again, we um, are not this, uh, as soon as we get your data, your high level payroll data, we, we are offering to return these results around within 72 hours. Alternatively, Please answer yes to this question if you would be interested uh, in just some consultation. So if you're not even if you're not ready to share data or, or to move to just getting those headline pay gaps identified, we're also interested in, in just talking to you. So uh, please please indicate that if, you, if if you're so interested. Our mission uh, again is to build better workplaces so our clients can build better businesses. <clears throat> so uh, thank you. That um, uh, brings us I think to uh, our our question period. If we have any questions that we might be able to address. Um, I, uh, hi, this is Joanna. Um, I'm pulling some of the questions that um, that were logged on on the question uh, and answer uh, page. And to the extent that we don't answer questions here, because it looks like uh, we don't have enough time because there's a, a number of questions. Um, one question um, that was raised is, um, can you explain more about how the audit can actually pinpoint a cause for the inequity? Um, so to answer that question, um, you know, audits tell you what the disparities are. It's, more, it's a quantitative measure, but these quantitative measures really give you insight on the reason for it. So if you have, if you conduct the audit, you're basically breaking down the, um, you know, the pay disparities, um, drill down to the uh, job category and the, uh, you know, in this case, for example, it'd be, you know, say um, it's African Americans versus white Americans. And so let's say, for example, um, there are, there's a 20 cent gap uh, on the dollar for uh, a manager level position among uh, between blacks and whites, but not at the entry level. So you can zero in on, well, okay, managers, there's a discrepancy, but there's no discrepancy at the entry level. So you can zero in on that particular position and then figure out what the root cause is. And, you know, uh, racial inequity is not a simple reason, um, but a pay equity audit from a, a risk standpoint, it tells you whether or not there's a gap. And so you can then take your first step to address it. Um, so as, as I'd mentioned earlier, uh, you know, pay equity uh, audits, it's a snapshot in time. And so let's say you find that there's a 20 cent difference um, and then, you know, you can, for example, um, engage in pay adjustments. Um, you can then, you can look at um, promotional uh, practices. Is there something going on in your promotional practice um, that causes this discrepancy at the manager level, but not at the, ma uh, at the entry level? So it gives you the tool to actually figure out what the root cause is. And that's, you know, among the many uh, things of value that the pay equity audit does is that's 
um, it gives you the tool to do that. Otherwise, it's just a black box. I think we probably have time for one more question. And this one, I'm going to turn to you, Mark. Question is, in small actually, company. Sorry, oh. Joanna, we do oh, have yeah. um, another webcast in behind. Okay. I'm, just, <laughs> sorry. I'm just running. I'm just trying to get these polls okay. here run for you. Okay. And um, I'm going to end this one here. Okay. And I'm going to run the last one and, and just share um, the closing uh, remarks as I do so. So I wanted to thank both you and Dr. Mark Dwyer for uh, such a fantastic presentation. So many comments coming in and great questions. And, and I know that um, the folks at Chosaic are going to follow up with your questions. Um, also a reminder folks that the archived recording will be held on hr.com. I'll have that up within 24 hours so you can view that again. And there were a lot of comments of folks wanting to view this that again. So this is always great. Um, your credit information will be emailed to you within uh, actually, the email should come within 24 hours, but your credit will show up in your HR.com within 48 hours. So after that, if any issues, you can reach out to us at events at HR.com. And again, thank you so much, everyone. Just fantastic presentation. And I'll let you close up there, Joanna, as I finish up this poll. Okay, well, um, since, since we've run out of time, um, you know, thank you for listening and our contact information is provided at the end of the slides. Um, so should you want to reach us, um, we will follow up on all the questions that were presented uh, in the Q&A and uh, we thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care.